Hi, I'm Robert Coleman. I'm a Senior Applications Manager at Texas Instruments. Welcome to Power Tips. Welcome to Power Tip 11 and 12. Here we're going to talk about how you can resolve your power supply circuit losses. Uh, this is typically happens when you go through all your calculations and you figure out your switching losses and your conduction losses and then you go to lab and sometimes the two of them don't actually line up very well. So this is a method where you kind of separate it out switching losses from conduction losses. So one of the things that we learned in college uh, was all about the Taylor series and it said that any arbitrary function of x could be represented as a a sum of polynomial terms, that is f of x is equal to a0 plus a1 times x plus a2 times x squared plus a3 and, and that continues on to infinity. So what I've done on, on the bottom here is I'm starting to take a look at applying the Taylor series to the losses in the power supply. So what I've done is I plotted the a0 term as a function of output current or you know I've replaced x with i here. I, I plotted a1 times i0 as a function output current and it's a straight line as you expect and then then the next one I, I plotted was a2 plus the output current squared. Then I summed all three of them. And what I've done here is I've curve fit the actual power dissipations in the power supply uh, with a Taylor series and I've just used the first three terms in the Taylor series to do the calculation. That is constant term, one that's linear with an output current, and one that's an x squared function of output current. And you can see the two curves line up pretty well. And so you can stand back and kind of map the different losses in your power supplies into these different coefficients. For instance, the A0 loss term is independent output current. And there are many types of losses in the power supply that are, are like this. For instance, the bias power in your control circuit is pretty much independent output current. Uh, power loss in a forward transformer is pretty much independent output power, as well as gate drive power. In addition, um, COSS and snubber losses map into this term also. The A1 loss term represents things such as a diode junction. You know, it's pretty obvious that the power loss and output diode is simply the diode voltage times the output current. There are some other good examples such as reverse recovery loss is related to the output current, switching losses, and then synchronous rectifier dead time. And synchronous rectifier dead time is basically how long the output current flows through the body diode in um, the synchronous rectifier. Then the last types of losses that are in the power supply are related to the output current squared. And you know, one real obvious one is the FET resistance. Um, it's just simply that some percentage of the output current squared times the FET on resistance. And then there are a number of other pretty obvious conduction kind of losses, the capacitor ripple current, winding losses in a transformer, etch losses in your circuit board, current sense, resistors, and then also the, the leakage inductance is factors in this. Uh, the amount of energy that you store in the leakage inductance usually gets dissipated. And so that energy is one half Li squared. So once again, we have an I squared term. It's kind of interesting. You can go back to that previous expression and solve for an optimum output current. That is where your efficiency is the best. And it's just related to the square root of A0 divided by A2. And you notice that there's no A1 in this expression. That's because the A1 does not impact its effect as a function of output current. So if you have more output current, uh, you have more output power, and there's no increase or decrease with load current. And kind of as an aside, most Effective designs have best efficiency about half load. Now, here's another way to take a look at this optimization also. Uh, what I have plotted here is the losses in uh, a MOSFET in a power supply. And I've plotted conduction losses, I've plotted switching losses, and I've plotted total losses 
as a function of the dye area. For instance, we've normalized it to one here that said that the switching losses and the conduction losses are, are equal at this point. So if we have the dye area, that means we're going to have twice as much resistance in the MOSFET and our um, loss is going to come up, but we, we will actually drop our switching losses in half. Or th This is related to COSS and, and then also IV kind of crossover losses. And you can see that the losses go down as a function of dye area. And so what I've done here in the total is that uh, shown that there is actually a minimum loss. That is, where the two switching losses and conduction losses are equal, that's the minimum loss point in your system. Typically what happens, though, is you can't afford this much silicon in your power supply. And typically you're going to be working over here on this side of the curve. This is something to watch out for because you can't continue to improve efficiency forever by increasing the dye area. Sometime you're going to get to the right side of this curve and more silicon in your power supply is actually going to reduce your efficiency. So thanks for your attention. For more power tips, take a look in the power management design line and search for power tips. It's also located at the EE Times website, or you can click on the link to all articles in the description section of this video. Thanks.